everyone, this is Barb Cochran and I am the director of the Deterney Center for Healthy Aging here in the School of Nursing and as usual I'm representing the Northwest Geriatric Workforce Enhancement Center which is sponsoring this geriatric healthcare lecture series for you. Um, today we are very fortunate to have Dr. Baja Belza um, coming to talk to with us. Her expertise is in the dissemination and implementation of evidence and community-based health promotion programs for adults with a focus on physical activity interventions. She has secured research and training grant funding from the CDC and other agencies, and she's an investigator at the Health Promotion Research Center and serves as the lead for the enhanced fitness efforts. Her earlier work was in rheumatology and symptom management where she developed a fatigue scale that's now available in 25 languages, and she has some very exciting information to share with you. Welcome, Dr. Belza. Thank you very much, Dr. Cochran. Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to be with you today. And uh, the topic for my talk today is physical inactivity, which is the new smoking and the importance of actual moving. So, OK. Um, hopefully out there in our remote sites, you're able to see these PowerPoints. But this very first slide is one that may be very familiar to a number of you. I see a number of smiles in the audience. Uh, this is the cover of Abbey Road, which is the album by the English rock band, The Beatles. And it was released in 1969. And many music lovers actually see this as one of the greatest albums of all time. The album, covers, uh, the album cover features the four band members from The Beatles walking across a zebra crossing outside Abbey Road Studios. And it's become one of the most famous and imitated uh, images in the history of the recorded music. And one of the things that is particularly interesting is this famous image includes a very common activity and that of walking. So with this image in mind, I'd like to move forward with my presentation. Uh, there's three main sections. Um, the first section I'm going to be talking to you about the context in which our society has become very physically inactive, and describe a little bit about how we've gotten to this situation, how we've gotten to this current sitting epidemic that we're in. Second, I will address the consequences, the health consequences of being physically inactive. And third, I will be discussing some strategies, strategies that will help both individuals and communities to get and stay more physically active. So um, what I'm hoping is that for those of you that are listening in um, on this presentation, uh, that you'll be able to take some tools away, some tools for your toolkit. Um, these tools may be in the form of research findings. They may be new information about physical activity and or strategies to help enhance your own as well as the clients that you serve their physical activity. I hope you will also take away a better understanding of the role of the built environment in helping people to get and stay more physically active. So imagine uh, the Beatles as we move through this and they're happily walking across uh, the zebra crossing, as well as then this toolkit and perhaps some tools that you can take with you from this talk. So overall, I'd like to um, start with the context. Um, so I want to talk about the larger picture, first of all. And this is an image of a wellness model. So wellness actually includes multiple, di multiple dimensions that are all closely interrelated. And each, dim each dimension then is vital to our pursuit of optimal health. So we are better positioned to reach optimal wellness um, by maintaining and optimizing each dimension of this wellness circle. So this model actually shows six dimensions of wellness. Uh, the first one being occupational, um, which is really our, vo or our vocation, which is our work and our hobbies. Uh, the second one is actually emotional, which is really our feelings, stress, and work-life balance. Uh, the third one is the spiritual, which is our life purpose and religion. Uh, the fourth one is intellectual, which might be our pursuit of courses, uh, books that challenge us, uh, other educational programs that we may participate in. 
Um, then there's the social, which is the connection with our friends, our families, our neighbors, and others. And then there is the physical. So the physical is really being the exercise and the physical activity that we engage in on a daily basis. And um, the reason I show this is I want to actually put our physical dimension within a context. And so that context is within uh, this dimension, uh, these multiple dimensions. Okay, so I'm going to start with a really key question here is, what is the one prescription that can prevent and treat dozens of diseases such as diabetes, hypertension, and obesity? And according to uh, Bob Salas, the answer here is physical activity. So why is this so important? Well, actually, we've actually engineered physical activity out of our everyday activities. We are now living in a society that is very much dependent upon automobiles. Um, and physical inactivity now is considered a major public health problem of our 21st century. It's according to Jim Blair, who is a researcher and expert in the field of physical activity and inactivity. So our major public health problem in the 21st century is physical inactivity. And interesting enough, every country then that has stopped walking has actually seen an explosion of heart disease. So our leading sedentary lives has serious consequences. So we actually have what I would say is a modern day death desk sentence, okay? So for thousands of generations, our environment actually demanded constant physical activity. We were out in the fields. We were having to hunt. We were not sitting at desks. So these technological advances that we've had, such as the internet, such as longer work weeks. I suspect many of us have worked longer work weeks than perhaps um, people who have come before us. They were more active, though, when they worked their longer work weeks. Um, has really led to our being more physically inactive. So when we think about it, think about the multiple times during the day you sit. You may sit to shop if you shop online. You may sit to pay your bills. You may sit while you work. You may sit while you're talking with your friends. You may sit while you're in classes. Uh, so these consequences of this changed way of our living is very profound. Well, how much do we actually sit? According to the research, that unless you're employed in agriculture or construction, you sit at a computer at least six to eight hours a day. And these technological advances have multiple um, side effects um, on our physical body. And just thinking about our use of a manual typewriter, uh, maybe I can see a show of hands of how many people actually have seen or used, let me put it that way, how many of you used manual typewriters? Okay, well, Actually, when you've inputted content on your manual typewriter, that required 100 more calories per day than inputting on an electronic keyboard. So if you multiply this by all the other devices that we have that, quote, have made our lives easier, actually have reduced our calorie consumption and has le led to major chronic conditions. So families, on average, watch at least five hours of TV a day. And that does not include the time spent playing video games, listening to the radio, reading, sitting, eating, sitting, texting, sitting, or talking on the cell phone, sitting. Um, so these are things that we need to be more aware of. And in fact, the total number of seated hours, on average, is anywhere greater than 50 hours a week. And if you like images, this is an image that I think is pretty powerful. When you look at what the TV does for us, we may think it may be entertaining us, but in fact, it is leading to multiple chronic comorbid conditions. So I bring up this whole piece about the sofa you sit in and the chairs that you sit in. Because in fact, many people now are proposing that these sofas and chairs should carry a health warning. So a little bit of history about sofas and chairs. They actually are now known to be fatal, OK? So sitting down is linked to some of the modern world's most top toxic epidemics, cancer, heart disease, and high blood pressure to stroke. So this humble chair actually seems like an odd candidate then for inclusion in our list of lifestyle killers. Sitting is as bad as alcohol overall alcohol consumption as bad as cigarettes as bad as hard drug use as far as its effects on us but the fact about chairs it's very interesting they're a relatively new addition to human life i bet you didn't think you would come and 
hear about the history of chairs. But not until the late Middle Ages in Europe, actually the only people that sat on chairs were actually kings and bishops, people who were in high ranks. And at ceremonial occasions, seats, uh, people who were seated actually showed that they were very much above everybody else in the room. So chairs with backs only became available more in Europe for the more affluent people and more around the 13th century. And it wasn't until the 16th century that they actually became common. And until then, mostly people sat in chests, on chests, on benches, or on stools. And those were considered the everyday seats. So seeing that seating, sitting, excuse me, is a recent fad, it wasn't until the 19th and 20th centuries that office workers such as clerks, accountants, and managers, they actually had mostly stood. And those people who sat actually were considered slackers. They were slacking. They weren't doing as much work as those people who stood. So indeed, some of the leading figures of the past couple of centuries actually have stood while they worked. So believing it to help them be more alert and co concentrate. So it's probably no accident that we are starting to see more standing desks now in our work um, environments. So I want to talk about a couple of um, revolutions. Um, but I think, um, and I do that because I think we're in the midst of a new revolution. So I'm going to talk about agricultural revolution first. So the agricultural revolution was really occurred about 10,000 BC. And this is when there was major changes in lifestyle where we did hunting and gathering, but there was a shift to looking at more agriculture, um, preserving of foods, more groups of people settling down. And these small and mobile groups of hunters and gatherers actually started moving to more sedentary societies, and they started having villages. So they started modifying their environment. We saw a lot more crop cultivation then, and we actually saw more higher dense populations. We saw labor diversification and trading of goods. So this was our agricultural revolution. If then we look next, we had the industrial revolution. And think about what's happening during these times. There was new manufacturing processes. And they went from hand manu manufacturing to more machine manufacturing. Iron production processes, more efficiencies with water power, increased use of steam, use of more tools. Okay, People having to be smarter, using less energy with using their tools. So now I'm proposing is what we are seeing. Well, first of all, why we call these time periods revolutions is they were actually periods of great turmoil, but they were fundamental changes in our society that affected the community at large. And so there were new practices that were adopted and refined in a very short period of time. So we had both the agricultural and the industrial re revolution. And I'm proposing now we have a walking revolution. And if you look around you, we're going to be identifying some things that are helping us see that we actually are having more people out walking. So the walking revolution is really a focus on culture change, but also behavior change. And it's not just for the individual, but it is for families and communities. So I want to show this first video clip with a little help from my friends in the back. Um, and one, I want you to take a look at it and see if you can answer this question. If you make it fun, will they come? So one moment, please.
in the back the So if you make it fun, will they come? They came. They really came. You made walking the stairs fun. They chose the stairs versus the escalator. See if we can do this more in our everyday environment. OK, so that was a bit of the context I felt that we are now facing as far as our sitting epidemic, um, why sitting is a new smoking. And now I want to talk a little bit about what the consequences are of um, our decreased physical activity. Um, so the verdict is in, and that sitting is really a health risk, as I mentioned, like many other risky uh, behaviors, such as smoking, excessive drinking, excessive junk food. And that we do know, the research shows that this sedentary lifestyle actually increases our risks of heart attack, stroke, diabetes, obesity, as well as death. So what does extended sitting actually do? Um, and there's a great infographic that I share um, the URL at the end of this presentation with that actually goes through what these numerous uh, things that happen to our body when we sit. And so this um, highlights what some of these um, events are. So what does extended sitting actually do to us? Our body actually starts to shut down at the metabolic level. Some of you may be starting to feel that as you sort of get comfortable in your chair, the room's a little bit warmer. Your whole metabolism actually is slowing down. Your big muscles become inactive. Uh, circulation slows down. You actually burn fewer calories. Okay. Um, the enzymes that break down our triglycerides actually totally switch off. We have less blood sugar um, use, so our diabetes goes up, where our risk for heart Disease actually increases. The enzymes that keep our blood fat in check actually become inactive. Uh, our, we have increased incidence of depression because our fewer feel-good hormones are circulating. Um, and then also, just as important, our posture shifts. Our, we have hip flexors that shorten and tighten up. Our spine muscles become weak and stiff. So these are all consequences of what happens when we have extended sitting. And then when we look at what the benefits of physical activity are, it's incredible. And as a reminder, the American College of Sports Medicine recommends that um, we get, as far as adults, um, get at least two and a half hours, that's about 150 minutes a week, of aerobic physical activity. And these can be broken down into small chunks as small as 10 minutes. So someone who tells me they never have enough time, I always ask them, do you have 10 minutes? But in fact, hopefully you have three of those 10-minute chunks on a daily basis. And this would be a moderate level activity of aerobic activity. So that would be a, perhaps a fast-paced walk, a swim in which you sort of push yourself, a quick walk on the golf course, uh, perhaps um, lifting weights. Actually, lifting weights is also that's something that's recommended uh, twice a week. So we really are looking at getting two and a half hours a minimum just to maintain our health. But obviously, if we have health problems, we probably need more than that. So when we look at the benefits of regular physical activity, this slide actually encompasses them. And for all the problems you saw with sitting, these are all the benefits of regular physical activity. And when you look at the percents, these are pretty strong. When you think about it, reducing the risk of heart disease, lowering the risk of stroke, reducing the incidence of diabetes uh, type 2, Reducing high blood pressure, um, also affecting certain types of cancer, also reducing the risk of developing Alzheimer's. Um, I might say the Institute of Medicine recently put out a report on cognitive aging, and the number one thing that there is the strongest evidence for as far as maintaining your brain, staying sharp, is being physically active. So really what's good for your heart is good for your brain, too. Um, and then, again, the effects on depression is pretty significant. It is as effective as Prozac or other behavioral therapies to get out there and be physically active. And in particular, for older adults, which I work closely with, we always want to look at how can we reduce the risks for falls. Um, and in fact, physical activity can improve overall muscle strength and balance. So these are pretty profound when we look at something such as physical activity, something that we grew up with that we need to remember to continue to include in our everyday activities. 
here's some research really showing the immediate effects of walking. So some people who get rather discouraged and saying, well, I, I can't maintain my activity for a month, for a year. If you look at the immediate effects of walking, it's pretty significant. Three 10-minute walks actually reduce your lipids circulating in the bloodstream after a meal. If you walk 10 minutes alone four times a day, you're reducing your blood pressure. And you can also reduce the inflammation new, no, inflammation that's known to increase the risk of a cardiovascular event. So again, 10 minutes seem to be this magic number. If you can get out just for 10 minutes alone, but do that three times a day, do that 150 minutes a week, you will be maintaining your overall health. We've also found that there are other benefits of walking. We know that there's major savings in healthcare costs. Uh, it's been uh, pro um, projected that physical inactivity costs an estimated of $177 billion a year in medical costs. Um, and that accounts for also 16% of all deaths. So again, if we're remaining physically active, we can help reduce the healthcare costs. Uh, this slide also points to the stronger sense of community and security and economic vitality that occurs with people that are out walking. People feel much more connected to their communities. People know each other. Uh, there can be improved business, too. And that there's also a sense of uh, local, state, and national parks. Um, it's very hard not to go walking in a park on a day like today that we have in Seattle. I don't know what your weather is in the rest of uh, our region here, but we have a beautiful blue sky day, and it's hard not to feel good, not to feel um, um, happier um, when we're outside, um, especially if you're walking through parks, um, whether they're local or national or state parks or any kind of open spaces. So again, in, in summary, some of the research really has shown that People who are inactive can improve their health by moderate um, regular activity. So what's really nice about that statement is anybody can start. You can start by leaving this presentation today and going and walking around your building. You can walk around the sixth floor here and do your 10 minutes. You can walk to your car or walk home versus take a bus. Uh, I realize it may be dark some places where you are, but you might have some long corridors that you could walk in, um, and that too would be a way to get your exercise. Uh, you could stop by the gym on the way home tonight, um, be a little bit charged up, excited, maybe just be delayed getting home for a half hour, 45 minutes, but you would have gotten your exercise in. So everybody can start today. Um, greater health benefits are achieved by increasing the amount of physical activity. Um, frequently, we um, give prescriptions to patients to get out there and do their exercise for a half hour, and it's a little too hard for people to start a half hour. Start at 10 minutes and work up. Um, we want them to do it most days of the week. If you can do it one day a week, but just doing a little bit each day helps, but doing more will be a better health benefit. And that all of us can benefit um, as far as our health at any age. Okay. And the good news here, and this is one of the reasons why I thought we might be in the midst of a walking revolution, is that when um, there have been surveys done, we've actually seen an increase in the number of people walking. So between 2005 and 2010, uh, through some surveys of 26,000 people, we've actually seen the increased prevalence of walking. So going from 56 to 62 percent. So we clearly are on the right trajectory as far as increasing the amount of walking that people are doing. Okay, I realize I'm focusing a lot on walking. Uh, there's clearly many other ways to be physically active. I find that that's one that we all can do, um, and so I usually include that in my talks. My next section now is to talk about some strategies that we can use. Um, we've talked about the context of where we have been physically inactive, and we talked about some of the consequences of being physically inactive, and now I would like to address some of the strategies. Um, and what's really nice about the time that we're in is there's a large number of support in num from a number of agencies in looking at how to get people more physically active. And so here are just four of them. There's a Healthy People 2020 that I will briefly mention. Our Surgeon General just recently released a, wa a walking call to action for walking and walkability. Uh, there is our National Physical Activity Plan. Uh, many of these both include adults and children. My focus is pretty much more on older adults, so you'll hear more about that in my talk. And then there is the exercise in medicine, which I really don't mention here, but it is primarily geared towards primary care providers. It's set up so that it's empowering uh, clinics to uh, make sure that they make referrals of their clients to community-based exercise programs. There's discussion about using a fourth vital sign. So the first three vital signs are blood pressure, 
pulse and respiration. The fourth vital sign is querying your patients about physical activity. Uh, exercise for medicine also talks about giving actually scripts that say how often you should be exercising, how often a provider wants their patient to be exercising, with what frequency and what duration. I have a little bit of an issue with that. You know, we typically think of giving prescriptions to drugs. I really think that people who are mostly healthy overall can walk on their own without getting a prescription. Obviously, if you have some uh, critical unchecked health conditions that you may need to get checked before you actually start a walking routine, but many people can go out walking on their own at their own pace. Okay, so first of all, as far as one of the strategies we have is clearly Healthy People 2020. Healthy People 2020 has some very clear um, objectives related to physical activity, and um, it's also couched within their overarching goals. The goals of Healthy People 2020 is to really attain high quality, longer lives, free of preventable disease, uh, disability, and injury. Um, Healthy People 2020 also wants to achieve health equity, and one of the things we're talking about as far as physical activity and walking, it's something that all of us, regardless of our economic status, can do. Um, and um, Healthy People 2020 is really out there to improve the health of all groups. Um, so I bring this up on this slide. You can actually see a number of the very specific objectives that have to do with physical activity uh, in Healthy People 2020 for older adults. What's also really nice about Healthy People 2020 is that the physical activity actually is uh, affected by these two areas, and Healthy People 2020 actually addresses the need to change our environments, such as availability of sidewalks and bike lanes that are close by, trails and parks, but also legislative policies. We really need policies that help improve access to facilities um, and the terrain that really support physical activity. So again, really good that Healthy People 2020 addresses both individuals but also communities. So what do walkable places look like? Well, here are some characteristics of them. Um, they're more dense than sprawling. They're well-connected streets, okay? They're useful destinations nearby, such as libraries, uh, grocery stores, uh, they're short distances to transit. We really like to see transit close by. That helps people to get walking. We see diversity of land use mixes, so where you have both retail as well as apartments, uh, where you have gas stations if people are driving, or bike stores, um, and then designs that are attractive and the, also the importance of safety and no crime. Then. So what kind of features should we think about? Um, this particular slide shows a number of those features. Um, so some of the bad parts of this particular slide is it's very interesting that this building has no access from this green strip here. So it's really unfortunate that you can't access the building there. Interesting enough, uh, the person who critiqued the slide also looked at this green grass strip. They actually describe it as pointless. Why would you have a green grass strip here? It really takes space away from the sidewalk. And the other thing is that's not so favorable about this picture is there's some actual um, uh, utilities, above the ground utilities, which really detract from the aesthetics here. But what's good here is there's low shrubbery so that it's not going to interfere with the sidewalk. Um, there is some trees there which may provide shade to the sidewalk, so that's good. Um, and actually the landscaping is fairly nice there, um, so that would make it beautiful to walk along there. So those are some features we would think about. Here's another image of what would be considered a walkable street. And think about the things that you see in this image that might be appealing to you to walk there. Why do you think these people are walking there? We actually see a cyclist there in the bike lane too. So think about this image and what would make it appealing for you to walk there. So here are some things. Um, there's definitely some street trees which make it more beautiful. Um, I have to watch out those leaves, though, because they can be slippery when they fall in the fall. Um, there's a mid-rise development there on the left, um, so we have people that are living there. Uh, there is what's called a TOD district. Uh, this is actually a transit-oriented development, so it's really mixed use, and that seems to be most favorable for people. Um, there's actually a medium there for light rail, so the light rail is set apart from the main street. There's bike lanes, and then there's a pedestrian friendly area. So clearly you can see the pedestrians walking safely on the sidewalk. So as much as we need to encourage individuals to be physically active, we also need to create environments for people to maintain their physical activity. 
Okay, so that's the Healthy People 2020. Um, in looking at uh, the National Physical Activity Plan, uh, their vision is that one day all Americans will be physically active and they will live, work, and play in environments then that facilitate regular physical activity. So what's really nice is what we're seeing from all these collaboratives is that people are focusing not just on the individual but the communities that we live in too. So this National Physical Activity Plan it's really a comprehensive set of policies, programs, and initiatives that really hopefully will increase physical activity in all segments of the American population. And the plan is set up is that there's a whole bunch of recommendations, but there's different sectors that are working on it. So it's cool. It's got business working. It's got education. It's got health care. It's got mass media, parks and recreation, public health, transportation, and land use. Um, and then nonprofits. So it's really nice that this physical activity plan includes all these sectors. Again, it's not just health, it's not just your primary care providers um, hoping that you are maintaining your physical activity, but it's actually looking at the whole community. So one of the other things that has just recently happened at the end of last year was our United States Surgeon General had a call, a call to action on walking and walkability. And this had been happened, this had been in the process for several years, so he in, inherited it from his the prior Surgeon General. Um, but it's a call to action, and we know when the Surgeon General speaks, people listen, okay? So what was really nice is this was not just walking, but it was also walkability. So again, the importance of our individual choices, how do we do that for ourselves, how do we do it for our families, but also the communities we live in. So as the nation's doctor, the Surgeon General actually provides Americans with the best scientific information available so as to improve their overall health and reduce their risk of illness and injury. So to create a healthier nation, we must promote health and the wellness of individuals, families, and communities. So the Surgeon General focused specifically on walking. It's a simple form of physical activity that can be done almost anywhere by most people. So he is encouraging Americans to add walking to their daily routine. <clears throat> so I'm going to show you another short video clip. Uh, I couldn't get a video of the um, current Surgeon General. So this is a parody from um, the White House. I'll leave it at that. And when you look at it, I just pushed the wrong thing. Um, when you think about this, think about uh, the importance of our president, whether it's someone on TV or not, and what they have to say um, about the importance about the of physical Everyone knows the president has no control over gas prices. Uh, so. Not everyone knows that. Duffy, do you have the new initiative? Mm -hmm. What initiative? Initiative. It sounds important. It is important. So tell us what it is. Did somebody say initiative? Actually, a bunch of us said initiative. I definitely said initiative. This initiative cuts the risk of heart disease, diabetes, and stroke. It says it does the same. It says it does the same for breast cancer, colon cancer, prostate cancer. Same for breast cancer, colon cancer, prostate cancer. It prevents depression too. And it only takes 30 minutes a day. Segway riders won't like this. What do they have to do? Nothing. I just thought so much to see. We need to talk to the president. I'm just headed there. That's where I'm headed. I'm right behind you. Headed there as well. Me too. Coming. I had another walk and talk to go to, but I think I'll stay with this one. Did you guys see this? What's the risk of heart disease? Well, we did. It's our initiative. Actually, it's my initiative. Yours, mine. What's the difference? Mr. President? Mrs. President. Mrs. Landing. Mr. President, I want you to look at him. Somebody's in the house. She's dead, sir. Right. Mr. President, I want you to look at an initiative. I'm a very busy man. But sir, we need your help. We need to convince the American people to do something that's good for them. <laughs> that's impossible. Please, sir, just have a look. Oh, my. What's wrong? It's not dangerous, is it? Not at all. Is it too expensive? Actually, it's free. Does it involve wearing leather gloves and tight pink spandex? I suppose it could, but no. The problem is that it's too simple. Yes, it's very simple. It's walking. I may be late to the game here, but what is walking? You know, walking, we do it all the time. <gasps> Am I doing it now? Sort of. Look at this, friends. Just one half hour a day or two 15-minute walks are beneficial. What about three 10-minute walks? That'll do it. Or 10 three-minute walks. That adds up to 30 minutes. This'll never sell. 
You're right. We need an idea. What about a show about walking and talking? No! no. Friends, in the time of Socrates, oh, philosopher kings would walk round and round the Parthenon to stimulate discourse. Walking increases circulation. It generates positive neurochemicals in the brain, and this above all, to thine own self be true. And more importantly... And more importantly, walking is where I get all of my best ideas. Thank you, Charlie. That was... So for those of you that are familiar with the West Wing series, that was a parody there. It was the closest I could get to someone in the White House. Um, but it illustrates um, we need to walk at all levels. Um, and um, I think the Surgeon General actually giving us the call to action was fairly impressive. Uh, they had many uh, demands as far as what their call to actions are. And the fact it was on walking this last year is another reason why I think we are in the midst of this walking revolution. So I think one of the questions we all need to ask is really what gets people active? And so there was a meta-analysis study of 163 interventions. Uh, so this is a study that pulls together all the intervention research around a certain topic. And this included over 22,000 adults. Um, and they really looked at the interventions that were effective in promoting uh, activity. And first of all, they showed that sex, age, Social economic status and ethnicity actually did not influence the effectiveness of physical activity interventions. Um, they did note that these interventions actually improved overall physical activity. So if those variables were not the ones that influenced the effectiveness, let's see which were. So this is the strongest evidence supporting how people get and stay physically active. So a single target as in physical activity. I'll explain what that means. Second one are behavioral approaches. And the third one is actually self-monitoring. So let's talk about these were the strongest evidence to support it based on this meta-analytic study. So number one is a single target. And what that means is that when someone would go in and work with their provider and getting um, some information and getting excited about being physically active, it really helped if it was just on physical activity. So typically what your provider may do is they may target multiple behaviors. You come in, you're diabetic, you're overweight, you're starting to have some pain due to your osteoarthritis. And what is the provider going to say is I want you to change your diet. I want you to start exercising. I want you to go to some stress management. And for these kinds of multiple demands on a patient are really the least effective. So what works the best is interventions then that really modify behavior related only to physical activity. So granted, we were only looking at physical activity outcomes. Not attempt to modify all behaviors. Because you can imagine, if you just choose, for example, physical activity, and hopefully it's the patient's choice too, is then what happens? They start walking. They feel better about themselves. They're probably less depressed. Their diabetes may get better handled. They may start losing some weight. And then they're arthritis may feel a little better. So starting with one is much more effective than trying to do multiple changes in one's behaviors. So why did it work? Well, according to Khan and her colleagues who did the meta-analysis, it's actually easier to change one behavior at a time. And if you think of yourself, how have you ever changed behaviors? It probably was not five or six at a time. It was probably one. Um, and that then gave you confidence, or the term we would use is self-efficacy, which is confidence in one's ability to take action, to perhaps then change another behavior. And it also doesn't dilute the importance of physical activity. So whereas you may say, it's easy for me to take these medications, I just have to go pick them up at the pharmacy and remember to take them. It's a little bit harder to think about how do I incorporate physical activity, but it values it by saying I'm going to focus on this one activity then. So that was a number one lesson learned, is focusing on physical activity. The second one, really, of how we change people's behaviors is really behavioral approaches. And what works is actually looking at interventions that contained at least one behavioral strategy. So something designed to produce a change in behavior. One change, such as adding walking to your everyday routine. Okay. This also then was including consequences, so rewards. So you walk, how do you treat yourself? 
Maybe you walk and you get to go home and read that book you couldn't put down. I've been reading uh, The Girl with a Dragon Tattoo, the fourth in that series, and I would go walking and then come home and treat myself to a chapter. It's a great book. It's fascinating. Um, so how do you treat yourself? What kind of rewards? Hopefully you're not just eating, but you know, you go for a walk and maybe you treat yourself by a phone call afterwards or something else that's pleasurable for you. Um, goal setting can be really helpful here. Um, patient contracts, contracting with someone. Um, what do you think you can do? How confident do you think you are about doing that? Setting some goals. Um, for those of you that like to do fun walks um, or um, swimming across the lake, how are you going to do that? How are you going to work up to that? If you're planning to swim across the lake this summer, how are you going to get there? If you're going to do a fun walk that's 5K, how are you going to do that? So breaking it up and doing some goals. And then the whole piece about self-monitoring. I think many of us are wearing these Fitbits these days, and they're a way to incorporate the number of steps we have. Um, you can set your own goals, 10,000 steps a day is usually what's recommended as far as health. Um, but if you're not there and you're starting at 1,000, great. Set some goals for yourself. Um, some people like to be competitive, others don't, but that's always a way that that might help you. And why did this work as far as behavioral approaches? Was it was action oriented rather than just talking, rather than you know having to go through. Well, were you physically active as a child? Did your big brother beat you up? You know, really being action oriented, looking at what is it that we can do as far as some rewards, some incentives. Um, okay, and the third one is really self monitoring, uh, and this is really. Interventions then that included practices such as keeping a diary, such as tracking some kind of activity in a calendar, record keeping, I think the use of um, um, any kind of pedometers or Fitbits is another way to track your miles, your distance walked. Um, and again, people, it gives them an increased awareness. Um, and then they have some history that they can work with. So those were the three that had the strongest evidence as far as how people's behaviors change related to physical activity. There was also moderate evidence. So again, um, that's a couple years old since that meta-analytic study was done. So we could look and do an update and sort of see, has this moderate evidence changed at all? So there is some evidence to show that supervised exercise, such as someone who is um, being overseen by a research team or a provider, can help increase your activity. Tailoring helps. That means adopting, excuse me, adapting an intervention. Um, to meet your needs. So whereas you may go swimming regularly, you may adopt that swimming to using the kickboard because that works easier for you. So you're not having to use your shoulders, let's say, if you have a shoulder problem. Contracting, sometimes that works between patients and providers. Um, and then an exercise prescription. Again, um, being very clear what patients need to do, how long, how often. So that was moderate evidence to support physical activity. So at this point in time, I would just like everybody to get up out of the chair. We have been sitting a while. Just encourage you to do anything but sit right now. I encourage those of you that are remote, uh, also get up out of your chair. There's some um, examples here on the slide of things that you can do. If you feel up to increasing uh, your length, maybe moving your arms to the left or right. Obviously not do anything to pain, but just anything just to help, relax release some of that tension from sitting in those chairs. Uh, move your head to the left and to the right. If you're just staying seated, that's okay. Just do some arm movement there too. Some good examples there. Wake up a bit. Very good. Turn around in your chair. If you want to stay standing for the rest of the presentation, I invite you to stay standing. That's really okay. You can do some walking in place. That's our little bit of intermission here. What's really important he here is the key is awareness. And I think of this as sitting is really a slow acting venom. If you think about it, your whole body slows down. While you might not be able to actually quit sitting at your desk, you can actually be more informed and prevent yourself from entering what I would say is a sitting binge, where you're sitting for long periods of time. Okay. See if you can't be more aware of what are those time periods that you are sitting. See if you can stand up, walk to the back of a room, walk around a certain area. Um, my mom does it, has a great example. She watches very little TV, but uh, she does get up during the commercials. She says, Basha, I think of you. So she watches her news in the evening, and when the commercials come on, she gets up and out of the chair. I mean, so what are some cues that you have? What can you do to prevent a sitting binge? 
Um, frequently, people will say, I love a book. I, I've been reading this book, and two hours later, I, I realize I'm still reading and I'm sitting. So, so one suggestion, really concrete, is to set a timer in the other room. Put your phone in the other room. Set a timer and break up your sitting session so that once every half hour, you stand up, you take a walk, you stretch. Uh, so doing some reminders there is helpful. I like to think that we would sit less and move more. So uh, we have instant recess as adults. Um, we enjoyed that as kids. How come we can't do that also as adults? Uh, okay. Um, we are seeing many more stand-up workstations. Um, I think um, people have um, different views about this. Um, some people like it because it does burn more calories. Uh, some people do have more back problems associated with it. So frequently you will also need to sit stand on a pad so as to uh, prevent any undue stress on your joints. But in fact, um, standing does increase people's focus. Okay, and then I also encourage people to give all your faculty, all the people that you're working with standing ovations, because that then gets you out of a chair too. Okay, and then I think it is important then to take the steps. Uh, here you see a cartoon of a group of individuals who are going up to their fitness workouts. And you have both an escalator there and stairs. And you notice that uh, the folks are taking the escalators to go work out. OK. Um, this is when the Surgeon General actually released his uh, call to action for walking and walkability. And I thought it was particularly interesting. The three gentlemen with him are all well known in the field of physical activity. The woman actually was less known. She actually happens to be someone who works for the International Council of Shopping Centers. So the Surgeon General and his recruitment of support for his call to action, he called in the shopping centers. Okay. And she made uh, very eloquent uh, um, comments about the value of mall walking. And so he, um, he has been, uh, the Surgeon General has supported mall walking efforts. Um, and so for the last part of my presentation, I wanted to share with you some of the results that we had in a mall walking proje project that we uh, currently have wrapped up. Uh, it was funded by the Centers for Disease Control. Um, but I think mall walking is a largely untapped resource that we have as a location for all of us to be much more physically active. Um, and so I'll title this um, portion of my talk, Shopping for a Healthier You, What Mall Walking Can Offer. So as I've mentioned, uh, we do have a sitting epidemic. It's particularly problematic for older adults who actually um, are the fastest growing, but also the most physically inactive demographic. Um, and we know then that walking has significant impacts um, on our health. So we had a wall, mall walking project. Um, we worked with collaborators in um, five different states. Uh, that's located on this map here. Uh, we were the lead center at University of Washington, but we worked with our colleagues in Alaska, in uh, St. Louis, in West Virginia, and University of Illinois at Chicago. Uh, this was a wonderful collaborative team. You'll see images of all of them at the bottom of this picture. Also with their little surveyor wheel. That surveyor wheel we used um, when we actually went into malls and looked at what the distances were that people could walk. So the overall purpose of our study, again, it was funded by CDC, was to evaluate the evidence and practices of walking programs in malls, but also other venues uh, for midlife and older adults. So we realized mall walking can also be helpful for moms, kids. We really focused on adults and older adults. And we wanted to look at not just malls, but we wanted to look at other venues because not everybody has a mall in their nearby area where they live, work, play, pray. And we realized that there's these other venues that are really attractive for people to walk in. Not, we're not thinking about exercise centers. We're not talking about stadiums. Um, but I'll mention a couple that we found. And they are also really good venues for walking. So we had a multi-method study here. Um, we first did a scoping review of mall walking programs, which is a way of reviewing the literature to see what is known about a particular topic area. Um, and so we looked back at the last 40 to 50 years to see what had already been researched about mall walking. So mall walking, for those of you that are less familiar with this strategy, is something that happens in retail malls. Uh, typically malls open their doors around, let's say, 8 o'clock. Security comes on board. The parking lots are completely empty. But the retailers have not opened up their stores. So the malls are open for walking. Uh, there's typically no charge. Some are formal. Some are less formal. 
There's free. There's parking there that's free. Uh, you have a security, so it's safe. And we'll tell you about some of our findings. Um, we also did um, audits. So we actually went to shopping malls and public venues in our five states. And we used what was called the HAN, which is the Healthy Aging Research Network Environmental Assessment Tool. We also then observed walkers. So we observed walkers using this SOPARC tool called the Systematic um, tool for observing play and recreation, but we modified it for our malls. And then we interviewed walkers, managers, and program leaders. So it was a really three-phase um, project that we did. Our scoping review included 37 different studies, and these are some of the key findings we had. So some malls actually have mileage logs so that you could actually document how far you walked. Uh, some of the mall walking programs provided warm-up exercises. They provided maps so that you could look at the distances that you walked. And then some of them had blood pressure checks, either by students, by staff from the Y. Um, environmental features, we found them, um, as far as the literature, that they were safe, easily accessible, which was really important to our adults and older adults, and well lit. Um, partnerships are actually really a creative way for malls to partner with local communities hospitals, senior housing, and others. And in fact, the mall walking program benefited, it promoted the role of malls in improving local health and building community. So not only did people get physical benefits, but it helped with the mall in their partnership with communities. And that's really important these days because malls are having to reinvent themselves. They are not the same as they were 20 years ago. With as much online shopping as we have, malls need to create other types of environment than just shopping. So malls now have become more entertainment centers, and adding this piece about a public health dimension of walking was also another um, valuable piece here. We did audits where we actually went to both malls and non-malls. Um, the malls were uh, structured buildings that were covered, but non-malls were um, places like Botanical Gardens in Chicago. Uh, the Woodland Park Zoo here in Seattle has an incredible walking program. Um, X-Infinity, which is a, a rink, an ice skating and hockey rink up in um, Everett, um, has a great walking program too. Um, um, Anchorage, Alaska had some walking areas around rinks that weren't just during the winter. Um, closed warehouses was another site where people did walking um, in the Midwest. And then we observed 530 walkers. We observed them for how quickly were they going, about what age they were, what ethnicity, um, gender, and then whether they were using any mobility aids. We've published that work, um, but just to summarize it here, um, clearly malls frequently have public transit stops. They have accessible parking. Most of them had wayfinding aids, which would be like signage to show people what direction to go in. Uh, they might have had established walking routes. Uh, they had even floor surfaces. So for our older adults who were frail, who might be at risk for falls, there were even floor surfaces. If there were steps, there were usually ramps too. Clean bathrooms, benches, places to rest. Um, access hours, typically people were walking before the mall opened. People still walk once the mall opens, but then you're like pushing all the shoppers and the parking lot gets a little bit more filled. Lighting typically was really adequate. And then despite the diversity then in location, size, and purpose, the venues actually were consistent with regard to environmental features um, that really helped adults and older adults walk. We did audits of public venues then. Um, and again, I mentioned the senior walkers at the Woodland Park Zoo. For those of you that are in Seattle, this is a wonderful venue, Tuesdays and Thursdays in the morning before the zoo opens. Uh, there is a staff person from Group Health who comes and stretches with the um, zoo walkers, and that picture is on the left-hand side there. Um, the um, zoo staff then, after everybody stretches, the zoo staff then comes out and talks to all the zoo walkers and tells them what's happening with the animals. And the zoo walkers love this. So they might say, you know, if something like a porcupine was just born or they got a new giraffe. Um, very informative. Um, and as you can see from this particular uh, picture here, uh, it was a sunny day. They had over 60 uh, zoo walkers there that day. The zoo has a flat paved surface. Um, very interesting setting for those of you not from the Seattle area. Next time you come to town, come join the zoo walkers. Uh, there's a picture of the X-Infinity Arena in Everett. And again, the walking is around the outside of the rink, but it's an exciting venue to be in um, if they're practicing ice hockey. 
Um, interesting enough, what we found at um, X Infinity, there was a school for um, kids with disabilities nearby, which did not have a gym. And so the kids with disabilities would come over and get their exercise at the ice rink. And one of the staffers actually made these laminated signs that you can see in that bottom right hand corner. So as the kids were walking around, they had to do these different uh, things on these uh, laminated signs. Either they had to dance or they had to do the crab walk. And they made it really fun for the kids. So these venues are both uh, really great as far as in malls, but there are a number of other um, venues um, that are open to the public um, that could be used for walking too. We also then um, observed the walkers. Most of them were older adults. Um, half of them were female, but half of them were male. So we're really excited about this being a venue for men to walk in. Very few use walking devices. Again, I think that's a great opportunity for us to work with our clients um, who use walking devices as a safe place to ambulate. Um, a quarter of them were ethnic minority. We realized that was very much dependent upon where the malls were located. And then they walked at a fairly good clip. Um, the nice thing about mall walking is people walk at their own pace, and that's one reason why a lot of mall walkers really like it. When we interviewed walkers, um, we found a number of things. Um, they loved it because there was a great sense of community. They didn't feel any pressure, although if people didn't show up, they got phone calls, um, which really helped build the community. Uh, companionship, they found multiple health benefits. They found that they were stronger, their chronic conditions were better controlled. They liked the fact it was safe. Many of these malls um, have security that are highly visible. They may be on their segways um, and they would be moving about. Some mall walkers actually knew the names of security folks. Benches are available and the walking route would be clearly marked. And this is what one of the respondents said. Mall walking is like a drug. If you miss a day, you really feel it. We also then interviewed program leaders. So some of these malls have more formal programs. Uh, these leaders told us about the sense of community that the walkers felt, that it was very inclusive, and there were multiple health benefits, and the fact it was climate controlled. So really positive of malls is it's climate controlled. So all of us who live in the Pacific Northwest know how frequent we have rain, uh, overcast, slick uh, streets, um, and it's really nice to be indoors on dry surfaces for our exercise. Here's a quote from one of the program leaders. It has been good to see the walkers become committed and benefit from the walking, like losing weight, lowering blood pressure, and making new friendships. I might mention uh, this um, picture was actually taken from Bellevue Square here in the Seattle area. They have an incredible program. It's a partnership between Bellevue Square Mall and Overlake Hospital. Overlake Hospital actually runs the program. And then they have a Y staff that comes and takes blood pressures. Great um, mid-age to older adults who really thrive off that program. Um, I'd like to show you now a video clip uh, that was taken place in uh, Bellevue Square um, in which you can... Um, hear from the walkers themselves. During this clip, I invite you all to stand up while you're watching this. About rate of them all. Especially if you find someone to walk with, as King 5's John Sharifi and photojournalist Kevin Sullivan discovered at Bellevue Square Mall. People of all ages are in here walking. In the stories we do, pardon the huffing and puffing, there are the people in the stories, like John Tucker, Mutsu Akata. Oh, it's just fun. Cynthia Hales. It gets our day going. The story is always about someone. It could be you. Or her. It helps me to keep in shape. Or them. Wait till you hear about Bill Tamora's story. And I am going to make you wait just a bit because... This is the moment in this story when you meet the expert. We got to hear from the expert. You're wearing great <laughs> walking shoes. We'll have to walk fast to keep up with Basha Belsa. Her feet are cl closest to us. This professor at the University of Washington School of Nursing is why we went to the mall today before the shops opened.
to the public. Now, do you walk together, yes. typically? If Professor Belsa hadn't written this 48-page law, law walking guide, published by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, we wouldn't have met John <laughs> Wutsu and Cynthia. Well, it keeps our heart going. <laughs> if the professor hadn't written the guide, The guide is to help malls establish mall walking programs. If she hadn't written it, Newsweek wouldn't have mentioned her in this article about malls and exercise. I'm about a mile and a half at about 2.5 miles per hour. Question. Walking's always good. To the mall walkers in Bell Square. You'd rather be here than outside? Yeah, yeah, I think so. There are some people who do do it outdoors. Why go outdoors when you can be indoors? Wait, that doesn't make any sense. Indoors when you could be outdoors? But here's the thing. Tell us, John. Regardless of the weather, then I'm going to be here. That's why Bill Tamura figures he's walked 12,000 miles in malls in the last quarter century. That's like walking across the country back and forth twice. Bill is 89. 140 over 76. The walkers first stop at Bell Square, <laughs> blood pressure check. The early morning program is run by Overlake Hospital Medical Center. It's called Walk for Life. It extends life and it enriches life. Yep. <laughs> it helps with socialization too. You know what? It's the people. Uh, you make friends here. You want to go and you want to be sure your friends are here. So that's why we, you know, that really keeps you coming here, too. Just the fact that you made friends. Here. We really don't know each other, but we're good friends, aren't we? She's a great yes, walker. No. Yeah, she's a great walker. <laughs> she's the best. Oh, oh come on. Me. Another question, not mine, Newsweek's. Could walking programs save America's mall? Answer. So malls are really having to reinvent themselves um, because of all the online shopping that people do. Malls So th that was uh, the perspective from the mall walkers on uh, um, one of the program leaders there who actually works for the Y, takes uh, uh, blood pressure checks um, and checks in with people. Uh, walkers there at Bellevue Square uh, can wear a name tag if they want. Uh, they can register the miles they've walked um, and um, learn about other programs that um, we also talked to managers uh, as part of our study, um, and they were very impressed. Um, they know about the health benefits of mall walkers. Uh, they actually felt there was business benefits, and I have to say that um, I have seen uh, walkers shop. So although that particular individual, when they were questioned, they said they didn't shop right when the stores opened, but I frequently heard comments of um, gentlemen, for example, who say, now I know what to buy my wife for her birthday. Um, I visually saw people coming in and out of the stores. So typically what people would do is they go in at 8, they may walk, get their blood pressure, get their blood pressure check, walk, and then at 9.30 or so they sit and have coffee, and then at 10 o'clock they either go home before all the shoppers come or they go shopping in. Um, but the managers of the malls did say that they thought there were business benefits. They also are really appreciating extra eyes on the ground, and it's very clear that walkers at the zoo, they've talked about how they noticed things before staff did. And also, we have some anecdotal evidence that in malls, the walkers may see doors that would otherwise be closed, open, or something else that needed to be looked into. Climate controlled, again, is what the managers really felt 
was a positive about walking in a mall. And they really liked being associated with wellness. Uh, malls want to have a new makeup. And so being associated with their community and wellness was a positive. Um, from that, we actually developed a, a mall walking program, a resource guide. We were really excited. The Surgeon General actually posted it on their uh, website for their call to action. Uh, this guide has been distributed to over 800,000 CDC email subscribers. Um, and we are constantly uh, putting it out there. Um, it's been picked up by a newspaper in Brazil. And um, as the show mentioned, uh, Newsweek had picked it up too. So um, this mall walking guide is about 50 pages. It's available at this PDF, or I'm happy to give you a paper copy too. And the purpose was really to inform policymakers, planners, mall, mall building managers, community coalitions, anybody working with older adults about some best practices around um, how best to either create or use mall walking programs. Um, and we feel that this has big implications for Healthy People 2020 as far as getting more older adults physically active and also increasing the number of people who actually then will meet the physical activity guidelines for Americans as far as uh, keeping fit and uh, keeping physically active. So I conclude with a great quote from Dinchi. Um, truly great thoughts are conceived by walking. All great thoughts, uh, truly all great thoughts are conceived with walking. So in concluding, I would encourage you to get up, uh, join all our leaders, and be physically active. Uh, I think it is possible to uh, change and to increase physical activity in ourselves and in the older adults we work with. It is complex, um, but I think it's very doable. Um, and again, we make both individual choices, but it's important that we work in environments um, and play in environments that are also conducive, conducive to us being physically active. So um, in concluding, uh, this is your health, your choice. So you have either 38 seconds to uh, get to the top or you have 38 steps to better health. So thank you all very much. So these were all walkers already in the program. So we um, first got agreement from uh, the mall managers uh, to go into the malls and do the audits, um, which meant looking at how long and what kind of space was being used and the bathrooms and um, level surfaces and transit. Um, and then we also asked permission to talk to uh, their uh, the walkers. Um, and um, we got permission, and we um, usually went through. Um, if there was a formal program there, we went through the program manager. But some of these uh, mall walking programs don't have a manager, per se. Uh, so we talk to people as they walk. Um, they all sit down afterwards and have coffee, and they all are very willing to talk. So we had no problem. And these people already were walking, so they weren't in any kind of preconscious way. They were active and active. Thank you for your question. So the Alzheimer's Resource of Alaska says, how do you motivate seniors to want to join a mall walking program? So the question is, is how do we You don't have to repeat them. They've got it through my mind. Um, so a couple of thoughts I have is um, providing transportation, because we frequently hear that transportation can be an issue. So for example, if you are working with retirement communities to make sure that the bus or whatever transportation is available takes people to and from the mall during mall walking hours. Um, the other thing that we frequently find is um, Bringing a friend, bringing a partner with you can really be encouraging. So if you have some um, individuals who already are walking, uh, to have them bring a friend. Um, incentives you know, are positive and minus, you know, whether you want to give them a water bottle. Um, that, that people have various opinions about that. But I think bringing a friend can be very helpful. Um, we found that programs such as Bellevue Square, which has the same staff person there Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, has really been able to build a partnership with the walkers as they come in. Uh, so there's a, there's a very strong sense of community. So I think that the transportation piece is important. I think getting the word out, I think getting, I mean, letting people know that this is occurring. It's amazing how many people are not familiar with mall walking programs. Um, and then also having people bring friends along with them. 
Uh, we have here in uh, Seattle, Parks and Recreation just started a sound strollers program. They actually are deciding to do it on Saturday morning. It's actually posted in their senior brochure that has all the other activities posted in it. Um, so um, again, having an agency who um, is something that seniors go to, such as the Parks and Recreation, may be another way to do that. I think the other piece is, is many seniors feel they can't walk long distances or walk for long periods of time. And I think the truth is about mall walking, you can go and just walk uh, one hallway and sit down and uh, talk with your friends. And the next day you may be able to walk a little bit further or a little bit longer. So it really does provide great variability there. The other thing I might mention is that um, there is a really active program called Walk with a Doc. It started in Columbus, Ohio. And um, you, one of the things we, we want to try here is maybe have Walk with a uh, in your mall. So if you have uh, an executive director who's very keen about physical fitness, and it might be someone that um, seniors might want to get to know, Walk with a mayor. See if your mayor won't join you and see if you can't have the mayor walk on the first Saturday or even once and see if that wouldn't be attractive. Uh, if you uh, have physical therapists that you work with, maybe you have a walk with a physical therapist um, on a couple mornings and people might be very interested in that. Uh, we've started to talk about walking with executive directors in our retirement communities because we know the retirement communities really like access to their executive directors. So those are some ideas. Let me know if any of them work. <laughs> So Chigiak Eagle River Senior Center is asking if you can share the links for the videos you showed, the Fun Theory Piano Stairs and the West Wing parody. Sure, I would be happy to do that. Barb, can you help me with that? Yeah. Yes. Um, do they have PDFs or do they actually have my talk? They have PDFs. Okay. This is what they have. Okay. So they're actually um, embedded in the talk, so Barb will be happy to share those with you. Uh, the Piano Steps is really an easy Google, uh, and same with the parody if you look at West Wing. Uh, I'll send them the yeah, link. Yeah, but Barb can send them to you. Thank you for asking. Mm -hmm. And then, um, I'm so grateful for the information. I do have a walking group. Problem is when you stop for a day or two, it's difficult to start again. What are your suggestions? Yeah, um, my first thought is if you miss a day that, you know, whether it be weather or other commitments, that you still try to see if you can't stretch at home um, or walk in place at home. I, I know many of us feel that this is an addiction we have. Once you get started, you want to keep up, you feel good. Um, so that might be something. It's a day that you can't get out for whatever reason, that you do something in your home. Um, and again, stretching would be really good. It gives you, you know, you're not doing the walking, but you do the stretching and that's important. Um, we do know that lifting weights is important. So if you have a water bottle, you have a can, do a couple of uh, lifting of weights too. Um, Emma Bjor, I hope I'm pronouncing that right says, thank you, I would love to start a walk with the doc program with my geriatric patients. Also, I think I'm uniquely qualified because I took an aerobic walking class in college. How do I make sure patients of different abilities all feel included and safe? Uh, very good. Um, the walk with the doc, you can easily enough Google it. Uh, you might want to get in touch with uh, David Sabgir, who is the founder of that movement. And they're actually walking programs uh, that are called walk with the doc throughout the United States. So you might go to that website and actually see if there's one in your geographical area. Um, and then your other question was, you've taken a walking class. Oh, how do you know about it being safe? Um, good question. Um, the patients with different abilities. Patients with different, yeah, patients with different abilities. So I, what I've seen most successful as far as the mall walking programs is that people all walk at their own pace. They walk in either small groups or just couples. No one is required or there's not even any nuance of having to keep up with someone. So there's no, none of that competition. People keep track of their own distance walk, but not for any uh, reward or any promotion of that. So I think really encouraging people walking at their own pace is really important. Um, We've got somebody writing, so we'll see what they have to say. Okay. Oh, just a thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions here in the audience? Um, 
So the question is, is do I have any reports of adverse events walking in the mall? I personally don't have any of that. Um, I, um, in reading the literature, there was no reports of that. A lot of the studies that we read were structured research studies. Um, so they did not report adverse events either. Um, I mean, I think one always needs to be careful. Malls are constantly going through construction. So um, typically I found them that they, you know, sort of flag off an area that they don't want walkers in. But I think it's important using the bathrooms to make sure the floors are dry. Um, but we ourselves did not see any adverse um, events um, in our particular study that we did. <coughs> Thank you for that question. Um, I do have a couple of resources here. Um, this is another really cool nine minute video. If I would had more time, I would have showed it to you, but I think you can look at it on your own. It's Dr. Mike Evans. It's an incredible, very active um, why we need to at least spend a half hour a day being physically active. I think you'll have a really good time watching it. If you do watch it, make sure you stand up while you're watching it. Um, <laughs> but it's something else that you could show your clients too. And they have a link for it. Um, and then also I might mention, uh, here are some references that um, I referred to um, during my talk. Again, the sitting infographic is the last one there. Some great images of what sitting does to our bodies. And then I would like to acknowledge all my collaborators uh, with my CDC-funded uh, mall walking project. Um, also, the mall walking guide is funded through CDC. And then also acknowledge the Aljoy Endowed Professorship in Aging. Thank, Thank you. you very much.